very much. Well, good evening. It's good to see you. I hope you've had a good day, and uh, I've had a good day. Uh, you know, one of the uh, things that I absolutely love uh, is the study of God's Word and preparation of messages and all that kind of thing. I just, um, I, I just love it. I, I feed on that. That's just kind of who I am, and I got to spend so much of today uh, studying and preparing and, and getting ready for a series of messages that I'll be sharing around the country, different places, and, and just really enjoyed that. I, I hope that I hope your day was as fun as mine, and uh, uh, it really was. Well, I, I want you to uh, open your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 7, and um, as you can tell, we're moving through uh, the Sermon on the Mount pretty quickly. That's why I do encourage you to get the book to kind of fill in the gaps. But um, and uh, this this basically is chapter ten uh, tonight, and uh, we'll uh, tap chapter ten out of the book. We're gonna look at something that uh, I, I think maybe um, you've never seen before in this passage of scripture, and, and I just kind of have to introduce this message with somewhat of a personal testimony, um, when I began to teach through the Sermon on the Mount, and, and my, my pastoral ministry uh, was basically 100% expositional Bible teaching. Uh, we were always teaching through a book of the Bible. Uh, in fact, uh, the last year and a half of my ministry, the last 18 months of my pastoral ministry, we walked verse by verse through the book of Luke and um, had just a wonderful time in that. And so uh, I, I share that with you say that our ministry has always been just teaching pretty well verse by verse through books of the Bible. And uh, when I got to the Sermon on the Mount in our, in our study of Matthew some years ago, God really began to deal with me about a lot of things, and particularly when I got to this seventh chapter. Uh, because there was something there that that I had read but had never seen before. You know, isn't it, isn't it awesome in the Bible that you can read something and study something and you think you know it all there, and then God says, no, i got a whole new deal for you. Um, and as the Lord showed me this, I got extremely convicted about it. Uh, b- because there's a, there's a scripture, and we're going to read this whole scripture here in just a moment, but, but I want you to look at something <clears throat> in, in verse 5. Now, in verse 5 of chapter 7, normally we look at those words, you hypocrite, and that's kind of what comes out. You know, we kind of let that jump off the page at us. Uh, But but I noticed something there I'd never seen before, uh, and it said, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. All right, so I read that passage of Scripture, and it dawned on me, that God wanted us in the speck-removing ministry. He, he wanted us in... You know, listen, if you've got a speck in your eye, which we'll talk about in a moment, or if you've got a log in your eye, you can't move forward. doesn't matter which one it is, right? You, you can't make progress. If it's a speck or a log, you're going to stand right there. It's going to hurt. It's not going to be good. You're not going to move forward. All right, so what the Lord was saying to me in that passage of Scripture, He was saying, Ted, look, I want your church to be a church that really can help people move forward. I, I want your church to be a church that I could really trust with, with some of the most unusual people and unusual circumstances ever, but there's some stuff that will have to happen in you and some stuff that will happen, happen in your church if you're going to be able to take the specks out of the eyes of others and help them move forward. There's some stuff that's going to have to happen in you. And so we began to work through that, and, and the Sunday morning that I preached this message, it was one of those days that, that God just showed up in an unusual way. In the early service, I, I preached. We did an 8.30 service and a 10.45 service. In the early service, I preached, and, and at the end of the message, we just saw God's people just move almost in mass into the altar and, and begin to, to, to cry and to confess and say, God, we want to be a church you can trust. 
And it was one of those services. They say, man, God, you did this in this service, but are you do this in this next service? And, and, and so sure enough, well, the next service I preached, and God just moved in a mighty way, and you could, just, you could just sense the Spirit of God on the hearts of the people, and there was such brokenness, and there was such desire, and, and that was so new for our church because if you know much about Tulsa, South Tulsa Baptist Church kind of sits in somewhat of an affluent area, and, and for our people to just kind of throw off all the chains and throw off all the inhibitions and just fall on their face before the Lord and say, God, we want to be a church that you can trust was a wonderful new experience for our people. So after that service, I begin to pray. God, would you, would you just show us that you can trust us? Just show us you can trust us. About a week after that, no more than two weeks, I think it was the very next week, Sunday morning, just before the 8.30 service, I'm out in our foyer greeting people as they're coming in, and uh, everybody had gone in, they'd started the music, and I'm about ready to come in, take my place in the front pew and worship with folks and get ready to preach. And one of our greeters brought this uh, young, attractive, uh, African-American young lady to me. And, and said, uh, Pastor, this is Lindsey Gray. And she really needs to see you. And I said, well, Lindsey, what, what can I do for you? And she was disheveled that morning. She'd been weeping. And she said, sir, I, I really don't know. She said, I don't know what to do. She said, I just was driving by this church and for some reason just turned in here. There was no reason to be here, but she said, I do not know what to do. I said, well, Lindsay, what's happening? And she said, well, last night in the Walmart parking lot, the particular Walmart just up the street from our church, she said, last night in the Walmart parking lot, my 16-year-old brother was killed. It was a drug deal that went bad, and he was killed. He was shot in the head and killed. And she said, I don't have any idea what to do. I said, well, Lindsay, I know what to do. After this worship service is over, you and I will get together, and we'll begin to talk through this situation. So that day I met Lindsey Gray. We worked through the funeral. We worked through all the things with her. Um, not long after the funeral, I was in Lizzie, Lindsay's home. She's a very um, articulate, professional young lady. I, I was in her home with her mother and Lindsay, led both of them to Christ had the privilege of baptizing Lindsay into our church fellowship, and my wife and I began to disciple Lindsay. We've seen now, in fact, a week ago this last Sunday, Jerry and I and Lindsay and her husband, whose name is Kwaku, I love that name, Kwaku is from Ghana, and Kwaku is a wonderful, godly young man, a year ago, I did the wedding for Lindsay and Kwaku. And, and, and I say this with great love and respect. I was the only white guy on the platform. It was awesome. The wedding pictures are glorious. And, and, but but la a week ago Sunday was the fourth anniversary of when Lindsay's brother was killed. And so Jerry and I, in honor of Lindsay and her mom, took Lindsay and her mom and Kwaku to lunch. And, and we sat in a restaurant in Tulsa after the worship service that morning. We sat, in a, we sat in a restaurant in Tulsa and we reminisced what God had done in our lives to bring us all together. See, Lindsay's father is not too involved in his life, in her life. And so over a period of time, Lindsay just kind of adopted us as her parents. And we've kind of adopted her as our daughter. In Lindsay's work now, she travels. And, and uh, today, uh, this morning, I got a text from her. Pastor Ted, 
I'm on my way to such and such. I'll let you know when I get there. And that's our deal. She always lets me know when she gets there. And then when she gets, she'll be there for two or three days. She audits banks, that kind of thing. When she's been there for two or three days, she'll text me back. She'll say, Pastor Ted and Jerry, I'm on my way back to Oklahoma City. I'll let you know when I get there. And I'm always saying to her, Lindsay, travel safe. There's all kinds of nuts out on the road. Be careful. Be safe. And we always end that text with, Jerry and I love you. And her text always ends up with, I love you. And last Sunday, as we left the restaurant, she hugged us and she said to me, I'm so glad I have you as my parents in my life. God trusted our church. God trusted our church. Not long after Lindsay's situation, there's a young man by the name of Jordan who had been a part of our church. Jordan is a bright young man. Graduate of the University of Oklahoma. Uh, comes out of a home that knew the Lord, knows the Lord, walks with the Lord. And Jordan's life was a mess. Not long after we as a church had gone through that process of saying, God, we want you to be a church that you can trust. Jordan walks into my office and begins to tell me all the crazy stuff going on in his life and how the Lord had brought him to himself. And in my office, he said, Brother Ted, I've got to start confessing some things. I said, well, what do you mean, Jordan? And he said, I've got so much wrong in my life. And God has forgiven me for so much. I need to go to folks, ask for forgiveness. I need to go to young ladies who I violated, ask for forgiveness. He said, some of those young ladies are now married. I need to ask their husbands to forgive me. I need to go to my parents and ask for forgiveness. I need, I need to come to you as a pastor, ask you to forgive me. And we sat in my office, and we made, a, we made a list of all the folks he could remember that day that he needed to ask to forgive him. About three pages of legal stuff. And he left my office that day, starting on that process. And every once in a while, I'd call him. Jordan, how's it going? Well, I got to ten different people today. I got to five people today. And after a period of weeks, he walked into my office and he laid that back down, that legal pad back down in front of me. And he said, with God as my helper and God as my witness, with everyone that I can possibly find, I've asked for their forgiveness. Now, why would God do that kind of thing in our church? I, I could take you Sunday to a class, or Wednesday, excuse me, Wednesday, to a class in, in South Tulsa Baptist Church that is filled with people who have come out of drug addictions, alcoholism, adultery, homosexuality, all kinds of addictions. And, and I could walk into that class today and it would be people who are loving Jesus and walking with Jesus and wanting Jesus to be the Lord of their life. Why would God trust us with those people? Why would God do that? I have a wonderful friend named Dan Pearson. Dan is an upper-level executive with this company. Dan is a phenomenal Christian. I remember the Sunday that Dan and Sharon and their three kids joined our church. And it wasn't long after we had gone through that process of God, just make us a church you can trust. Just make us a church you can trust. And they joined our church, and it wasn't long after that that Dan came to see me and he said, and this is a godly, wonderful family, incredible family. He said, Pastor, we've just learned that Sharon has cancer, and it's a bad deal. About a year after that, Sharon went to be with the Lord. Dan today is a single dad, walking with Jesus, loving Jesus, but needing the support of his church as never before. Why would God trust us with Dan? Why would God do that? Well, I, I think it's because as a church, we came to an understanding of Matthew 7, 1 through 5. And so what I want to do for the next few minutes, folks, I, I want us to talk together about becoming a church God can trust. But just really becoming a church.
that God can trust. And you know, and it's interesting, what we saw happening at South Tulsa Baptist Church, and, and in eight years of ministry there, we saw something over 1,500 people join that church. And, and, and to be quite honest with you, the last four years, or five years now, after we really got to that place, and God, can you trust us? Will you tr we just saw people of all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of situations and all kinds of challenges went to that church. And even a week ago, Sunday, when Jerry and I were back and with, with Lindsay and her mom, uh, that in that early service that day, there were five or six people, Jerry, that joined the church that day. They don't have a pastor yet. They're still looking for the person who's supposed to follow me. But there were five or six people who joined that church. And every one of them, as I began to ask questions to the staff there about who those people were, every one of them had some kind of particular needs. So God is still saying to the church, I can trust you. I can trust you. Okay, so, so look with me. And I'm going to let you remain seated. I want you just to look very carefully at this passage of Scripture. And, and we're going to walk through it together for a few minutes. And, and let's talk about becoming a church God can trust. Becoming a church, God can trust. Now look with me in, in chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord, now keep in mind, he's got this little group of disciples here. And he's speaking to them. And he says, <clears throat> do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the same way, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, now folks, as I read that passage of Scripture, God wants me to see clearly how to help other folks move forward. He, he wants me to be able to do that. He, he wants me to understand that. He, he wants me to, be able to have a plan to, to help people and disciple people and encourage people. He, he wants me to see clearly how to take the speck out of somebody else's eye so they can move forward. But he says, before you ever do that, there's some other things that have to happen. And so let's walk through this. And, and, and let me just share with you some truth I believe the Lord gave me about becoming a church God can trust. The first is this. As a church, we must live by the sowing and reaping principle. We have to live by that. Now, now you know, we all know the, the verse, whatever you sow, you reap. We know that. I'm just not so sure we believe it. Okay? But, but, I, but I want you to see there is a sowing and reaping principle in this passage of Scripture, and it has to become the principle of our life if, if we become a church God can trust. Our church had to learn this. This was not an easy thing for us to learn. But God did an amazing work for that to happen. And we had to learn as a church that we had to live by the sowing and reaping principle. Now, I want you to notice the way the, way the Lord puts this in these first verses. Now, now, look at this. Do not judge. Okay, do not judge. Now, in the Greek language, that, that's in a grammar that says, stop right now. D don't put this off. Stop right now. If you come to a stop sign out here, you don't pull up that and say, well, maybe I'll do that later, right? No, you stop right then. All right, so when the Scripture says, do not judge, it's of a grammar that says, okay, take a good look at yourself now. Stop judging. If, if you're judging, stop doing that. Now, now this, is, this is real critical. The word, the word judge there um, is, is a word that means to separate, all right, to, have, to, have, to separate, or it means to condemn but when you put it all together, it means to form an opinion that separates. To form an opinion that separates. For, for example, uh, let's just say the day that Lindsay walked into our church. Um, I, I'll tell you, she was completely different than the average person at South Tulsa Baptist Church. We, we, we didn't do drug deals in our parking lot. Okay? We, I mean, that, was the, we, we, that wasn't what took... Now, we had kids involved in drugs we had families involved in but but we but but to have somebody who for for that young lady to walk into our building and say last night my brother was killed and it was a drug that's what happened in north tulsa 
That didn't happen in our area. But yet it was happening in our area. And so it would have it would have been very easy for South Tulsa Baptist Church to kind of say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's not who we are. Pastor, that's not that's not our direction. That's not what we do. But they didn't do that. They reached out and they brought nobody formed an opinion that pushed her away. See, nobody formed an opinion that made her feel uncomfortable. In fact, as we introduced her to particular church members, got her involved in church members, it's it's like the church family was saying, you're exactly who we want. You're exactly the one we want in our life. See, so so to judge means that that I have an opinion about somebody, and, and my opinion kind of causes me to be separated from them. To judge is not to say they're a sinner. To judge is not to say there's something really wrong about their life. No, to judge is simply to have an opinion, and that opinion would cause me to be somewhat separated from somebody. I mean, I... Just kind of think about it, and you'll know who this is probably. I have no idea it is. But, but think about who might be the meanest, most rotten, sinful person in your town. Now, you're going to think of several different folks, right? Okay, so just, just kind of who's the who's the most. What if that person right now, well, in fact, let's even go further than that. Somebody maybe that you've really got something against in your heart. They've hurt you. They've struggled with you. They've lied to you. They've been unkind to you. But now all of a sudden, God begins to get hold of their heart. And they walk in the side door of this church. And they walk into this building. At that moment, none of us can have an opinion that says we separate. Can't do it. That's judging. That's what judging is, see. Okay? All right, so now now look at this. Do not judge. Now, Now, why are we not supposed to judge? Why are we not to have opinions that separate us from people? Do not judge. So that, that's what the scripture says, so that you will not be judged. That's the sowing and reaping principle. See, if, if you have an opinion that separates you from people, people will have an opinion about you that separates them from you. See, if, 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 I, if I want people to walk into this building who are lost and ungodly and their lives are absolutely falling apart and I have an opinion that separates me from them, they'll know that, and you know what they'll do? They will separate from me. They won't be here. In fact, they'll tell their friends who are in the same situation that they're in not to go to that particular place. There will be that separation that will take place. But when people who don't know Christ, people whose lives are absolutely falling apart, when they walk into a place and they see they are loved and they are cared for and they are wanted and, and, and somebody wants to reach out to them, they'll tell their friends that are just like them. And before you know it, you've got a whole bunch of them showing up. But you can't judge. You can't do it. If you're going to be a church that God can trust. Now, if we don't want to be a church God can trust, then that's okay, I guess. But if we're going to be a church God can trust, we must live by the sowing and reaping principle. And, and I, want you to, I want you to notice something. This is so interesting to me. Look at verse 2. For in the way that you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Okay, now a standard of measure is this. Um, Jerry has in, in her kitchen at the house this one little drawer that is filled with all kinds of standards of measurement. It's these little orange spoon type deals. And some of them will say half a teaspoon. Some will say a teaspoon. Uh, you, you can keep looking. And some will say a cup. Some will say half a cup. All right, so that's a standard of measure. All right, now listen. Look at what Jesus says. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by the standard of measure, by your standard of measure, it will be measured. In other words, if I pour a spoonful of judgment on you, then I can expect a spoonful of judgment back. If I pour a shovel load of judgment on you, I can expect a shovel load back. If I've got a backhoe and I'm just pouring all kinds of judgment on you, 
then I can expect all kinds of judgment to come back on me. In other words, if I separate from you, you'll separate from me. If I separate from you a lot, you'll separate from me a lot. If I separate from you even more, you'll separate from me even more. And you take the person who doesn't know Christ, they're not involved in Christ, their life is falling apart. And if they sense judgment from us, if it's a little judgment, they'll kind of step a little ways away. If it's a lot of judgment, they'll step even further away. If a whole church judges them and just kind of separates from them, they will absolutely separate from that church. So a church has to learn to live on the sowing and reaping principles. If, if, if we separate from people with our opinions, then they will separate from us. Now, there's, there's something else that, that I want to see in this passage of Scripture. Not only, if we're going to be a church God can trust, must we live by the sowing and reaping principle, but we must develop the practice of noticing the seriousness of our own sin. Now, beloved, let me, let me tell you, and you understand how I'm saying this. I, I know that we know how bad our sin is. Okay, I know we know that. But practically, we kind of live like everybody else's sin is worse than mine. See, that... I, I remember as we walked through that entire process with Lindsay and her mother, um, the young man that killed her brother was arrested within just a few days. Just before he committed that murder, he had turned 18. So now he's an adult. And so the, the, the process started. Uh, Lindsay uh, and her mother asked Jerry and I, to walk through that process with them. They were the victims, and so they're going to walk through that process. And so we began to walk through that with them. I remember the trial. He was found guilty. Some time went by, and this young man is going to be sentenced. And so Lindsay called us, and she said, Pastor Ted, um, the sentencing is such and such a day. Would you go with me? And mom, while we walk through that, we said, absolutely, Lindsay. We've walked with you through this thing. We're going to walk with you through it all. And so we met Lindsay and her mom uh, at the court. We went in. District attorneys came over, gave us some instructions. Now, Lindsay was going to speak as one of the victims to that young man in the courtroom. And so she had shown me her speech, and it looked amazing. And so the time came. They brought the young man in, and he was shackled. And I remember looking at him thinking, my soul, 18 years old. He's going to prison the rest of his life. And that's, that's basically what happened with all the sentences they piled on upon the other. So he comes in, and they seat him. And they made some remarks, and finally the time came for Lindsay to speak. She's very articulate very attractive young lady. She was seated between Jerry and I. And she got up. I'd seen her speech. She walked over, sat down in the witness chair, had her speech in front of her, and just turned it over. I don't remember all that she said to the young man. It was very kind, very forgiving. But at one point, she said this. You took away a very important part of our life. I know my brother was involved in some difficult things, but you took away a very important part of my life, and it was a great sin. And then she said, but your sin is no greater than mine. And I came to a place out of this for I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and he has forgiven me of all my sin. And I pray that you will see that your sin can be forgiven. And she got up and came back and sat down between us, and she just went, Whew. Did you hear what she said? Your sin was no bigger than mine. 
Now, folks, I want you to see something in the Scripture because one of the things that we are prone to do is when folks come into our facilities or come into our lives whose, whose, whose sin is great, we, we tend to look at their sin as if it's worse than ours. And we will express it to others as if their sin is worse than ours. And which, by the way, is the judging principle, see? And so if we begin to express that, that their sin is so great and they've got such a mess in their life, we begin to see their sins if it were bigger than ours. Now look at the way Jesus sees this. This is absolutely phenomenal. Now I want you to look with me, um, beginning in, in verse 3. All right, now, now look at this. And, and I'm going to show you several words. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. All right, now, now, now I want you to look at several words uh, in, in verse 3. First of all, look at the word look. Why do you look? It, it means to inspect. It's not just a glance. It's not just to notice. It means to, it means to really look. It's the idea of looking in the eye of somebody. It's the idea of looking at a map. And, and looking at every turn and knowing exactly where you're going to turn. And, and, and it, it's really inspecting something. It's looking close. It's, it's the same word that would be used of someone who looks through a, a microscope and they're looking at every cell and look at the makeup of those cells and they're inspecting everything about that. All right, that's the word look. That's real critical. All right, so Jesus says, Why do you inspect the speck that is in your brother's eye? Now, the word speck is so interesting to me. Because it, it means a, a, a stick or a splinter, but most of the time it was used as, as a little piece of fabric that would just float in the air. If, 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 you know, if the sun gets just right, you can see the dust particles in the air. All right, that's the word speck. All right, now, now Jesus calls their sin a speck. And he says, now, why do you inspect that? Why are you looking so closely at this little fuzzball that's in your brother's eye? Why are you looking at that little piece of flint that's just floating around? Why are you doing that? And, and now look at what he says, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye? Now, look, and do not notice. Now, stop right there. Don't even read another word yet. Do not notice. I love that phrase. Do not notice. Now, now, um, I like cars, and I particularly like Mustang cars. And, and, and I, I, I had my first uh, Mustang uh, in uh, 1966. Uh, I, I had a 66 Mustang. Oh, it was awesome. Wish I had it today. Uh, when I was a senior in high school in 69, I traded that in and had a 68 Mustang, 289. Uh, white C stripes, red, white C stripes, red line, right ovals. I loved it. It was awesome. Had that for several years. Jerry and I got married. Hadn't had one for a lot of years. Uh, here a few years ago, I had an opportunity to buy a 93 convertible Mustang GT, red, white leather interior. Awesome. Loved it. Fast, quick. Uh, I, I, and I had it for a few years. Sold it. Bought a 96 GT, 5.0 convertible. Red, brown interior, camel interior, absolutely loved the car. Had it for several years. Uh, got rid of it not too long ago. Bought a 2010 convertible. It's at the house right now. I love it. It is awesome. It, I, 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 okay, now that's who I am, okay? That, that's who I am. Not long ago, we're driving down the highway, and this guy comes around me in a, in a, in a, in a new Mustang Roush. I mean, he just shoots around. It's a red streak. Boy, it shoo, boy you hear roar, that thing. You know? And I said, Jerry, did you see that roush? She said, no. I said, are you saved? Are you saved? Did you, you didn't see that roush? And honey, I didn't even notice it. You didn't notice it. I didn't even notice it. You get it? Jesus says, you don't even notice something. And what you don't notice is the log in your own eye. Now, folks, listen. That word log, you know what it means? A roofing beam. 
a roofing beam. Somewhere in this building are some beams. Or this roof's not going to stay up. Some beams. A roofing beam. When I, when, when I taught this message to our people, I had a railroad tie on the platform because I couldn't get a roofing beam on the platform. Not, not, not a railroad tie, a roofing beam. I, now, now, folks, do we, do we see what Jesus is saying? Why do you inspect that little dust particle that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the roofing beam that's in your own eye? Now, now, now let, me, let me give you a principle that we really do need. Now, listen. That which I see in your life is always smaller than that which God sees in mine. Okay? That which I see. Now, if we look at one another's life, I promise you, you can look at my life and find some stuff. Okay? You can do that. But whatever you see in my life, God says, is always smaller than what he sees in your life. But whatever I see in somebody else's life is a speck. But what God sees in my life is a log. And, and so the principle behind that is we must develop the practice of noticing the seriousness of our own sin. Some, some, some alcoholic could walk into our building and just be a mess. And life just be crazy. And they could be a wife beater. And they could be involved in all kinds of felonies and all kinds of stuff. And I could look at their life and I could see all that is wrong. But if I'm not careful, I'll forget that God looks at my life and says, Your stuff's a log and their stuff is a speck. Don't, don't you judge them. Don't separate from them. Don't you get in a position that you think you're better than they are. God says, Ted, all the stuff I see in you is a log, and all you can see in that guy is a speck. So we've got to learn to live by that. Our churches will never be churches God can trust. Never. I, 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 could, I could take you to couples in our church tonight where there was adultery, where there was all kinds of immorality. And, and I can show you some couples that the world would have looked at them and said, they are such a mess, nobody could do anything with them. But some of the precious folks of our church reached out as if to say, if your adultery is just a speck and my stuff is a log, why would I not reach out to you? Why would I not care about you? Why would I not pull you into my life? Why would I not minister to you? Why would I not love you? Why would I not make you my brother or sister? God says my stuff is a log and your stuff is a speck. Jerry has a precious, precious friend that if, if we just wanted to tonight, you could name me your top ten greatest sins and she's done it. I'm telling you, she's done it. Everything from adultery to abortion to marriages broken up to drug addiction to stealing. Oh, you name it. It's there. 